world of Utopia is quite a strange one because it was developed bit by bit. Um, finding components that I just liked, um, welding them to other components, building things around them that looked okay. And a funny thing happens when you're creating a, a place like that because you don't think about the whole thing at once. You, you're just thinking about components. That looks good, that looks good. You put it all together and then you stand back. It's actually quite strange looking and it has a binding aesthetic, which has probably got something to do with um, my personality and taste. But at the same time, it, it, it looks weird to me. Like somehow familiar, but I don't know where those shapes and things come from exactly. Perhaps it's something to do with um, distant childhood memories. I mean, when I look at it now, I think maybe it's some deep-seated memories of playing with toys as a toddler. And the kind of colours and shapes, the spatial relationships, um, the weird physics, you know, floating things and um, scale shifts. Maybe that is feels right to me because it's based on some distant memory that's still lingering. And a lot of the story, of course, is about that. It's about distant childhood memories that are, are sort of in the subconscious somewhere. We don't address them very often. We don't look at them. Um, but they're there and they, they maybe inform some of who we are now as adults, um, stuff under the surface. I wanted to try and create something sort of otherworldly, you know, sort of a sound that, that really could come from any time or place, that it, um, but felt otherworldly at the same time. Yeah, so the utopia scene was interesting because there was a question of how um, experimental do we make the scene? Do we really explore uh, these strange looking characters or do we make it more about the story? In the end, we decided to make the music warmer and more melodic, so we put a guitar in strings so that the audience really felt uh, the conclusion of the story. Utopia sequence, that was actually the first sequence that I worked on um, full-time with Sean. And it was a great starting point because it was always going to exist slightly on its own as a separate sequence. Sean again produced a great set of illustrations and reference sketches showing all of the creatures, the sort of new designs for the creatures in Utopia. It was a big sequence to animate because there's so much going on. But you know, I'll just animate it creature by creature, add in another one and another one slowly until the whole scene was built with all the creatures and, uh, and it just became more and more rich and dynamic as it went along. Um, and each, each character actually presented a slightly different challenge because there's such a, a wide, varied selection of designs, um, styles of characters. So the horn character, for example, discovered that it's, it's sort of um, drastically tapering shape, very wide at one end and very narrow at the, the end. John's sort of texture reference for that was very specific because the, the scale of the surface texture had to stay constant throughout, not taper down and get narrow at the bottom. So that actually produced a very interesting challenge in terms of um, texture mapping, the, the approach we took to texture mapping that character. Or say the, the blimp character who um, sits up in the sky. He has all these little individual bottles that sort of um, sway around on their own. So that was another little sort of challenge for the the modelling and the rigging. The Utopia sequence is a really tricky design challenge. We, it was a collaboration between me and the Foley artist Adrian um, and we were looking at this stuff and thinking to ourselves, well, how literal should we go? How non-literal should we go? And so we broke down each character in terms of what it was made of, the visual texture of the creature and also um, the way it moved and that necessarily informed its character and personality. And using those things as our guidelines, we then look to our prop closets. One of my favourite sounds in the sequence was the uh, the pencil creature that draws um, the the markings on the ground. Uh, to create that creature, like I tried things by like miking up a pencil really close, and it. it it was the right sound on a literal note, but it didn't communicate the texture, weight, size, or emotion that we needed. And um, I, I didn't know what to do about it. And so a week later, I was in a woodworking shop where my friend's a carpenter, and um, he rubbed two bits of wood together. And I heard that, and I was like, wow. And I thought, wow, that's the sound. And so we took that into the studio, 
and by rubbing the woods together we got the sound that we needed. But there was a beautiful surprise in this. Um, the wood made a squeak and that squeak suited um, immediately before we see that pencil creature there's a bird um, with a, a heart in a cage and it squeaks but it squeaks from a wooden mouth and uh, we instantly replaced the bird sound that we had in there and used the wooden squeak instead. My favourite moment of the film is also my favourite picture in the book, or page in the book, and that's the goodbye sequence, you know. And it was very important. I mean, I loved the whole leading up to, for obvious reasons, the, the, the big reveal of Utopia. But um, it was very important for me to be able to capture the, the pathos of, of the original picture. This, you know, it's a sort of touching moment. I know a lot of people think that should have been the end of the film. In terms of the lost thing going, to a place where it belongs, um, at least where it's happy. We don't really know whether it belongs there or not. It just, we just know that it's happy and that's the main thing. And of course, um, the story could have ended there, but there's, a, there's almost like a little epilogue about the boy reflecting on his life at the moment and how the whole story is merely a, a memory, and quite a distant memory, and one that's becoming increasingly harder to recollect. Um, and that kind of adds a, a somewhat sad note to the end, which is a counterpoint to the creature. Um, I mean, I could talk about that endlessly, but in the first instance, it just felt intuitively right. It felt also um, very honest as, uh, in, in the way that I understood the story personally. And you'll notice in the film that the, there is no music over the credits because it's almost like we've had the dream of the story like this magical memory of some sort of weird childhood experience and then it drifts into this rather dull urban existence and in some ways that, that is a transition from the film into the real world. It's funny when the book was first, uh, when I was working on it and I was showing it to some friends, I had such different responses. Um, once some some Someone said to me, um, it's, it's the most delightful and whimsical thing I've ever seen you create. And within the same week, another friend said, it's like a living nightmare. Um, and this is of the same story. And so I kind of find it interesting that there's a different possible interpretations. But I think too often we, as viewers, um, and I myself am like this, tend to get hung up on the dichotomy of good and bad or positive and negative endings. And I think filmmakers um, often have this problem of making a decision between a, a happy or a sad ending. Um, always with all my favourite films, um, the endings are ambiguous. Whether those creatures would have a life outside of, outside of the film is you know, anyone's guess. I quite like the fact that you just glimpse them briefly and in your imagination, they have a whole other life. Like each creature might have a, a long origin story like the lost thing um, that we don't know about, but we're free to imagine. And sometimes it's best not to say anything more about them, to just show them briefly and let, let the audience kind of uh, imagine things for themselves. And hopefully, I think, go away and um, take the concept of the lost thing and apply it to a whole other, lot of other situations. So it's, it's still not a clear concept but it's something that's highly adaptable, like anything could be a lost thing.